Judith for, um, and where did Judith go? Judith, thank you for inviting me and, and for that introduction. Um, uh, and I guess what I'm going to do is take, uh, I'm told, 15 or 20 minutes, give you a summary of this project. Um, and I don't really have uh, uh, sp specific questions that I, uh, that I want to put to you, um, but what's happened to this project um, that these slides don't represent um, are some, I think, interesting um, follow-on projects that we're now exploring, which will in various ways scale up and translate a lot of the technologies into different applications. And I think uh, there will be um, a lot of interesting legal and ethical questions are going to come up. So hopefully we will um, we will be able to kind of explore some of those. Um, <coughs> so uh, these are. Um, I think I'm not in the way, right? So I'm standing here. Okay. So the, these are um, the members of my group, and the ones that are uh, shown in, in high contrast uh, have all at some point contributed um, to the project. Uh, in particular, Phil DeCamp and Brandon Roy um, are, are two primary people. Just lost one projector. Oh, um, you're out there. You look pretty good. I know it works, so I'm not worried. You want me to disconnect and reconnect? Yeah, well, I didn't know that. It was happy. Okay. So, the point of this project is. Um, to record um, and analyze and ultimately to model aspects of um, how children learn from speech in the home. Um, so if you want my little animation here, uh, that's where the, the term speech ohm comes from. It's a made up word, um, speech in the context of the home. Um, <coughs> and the human speech ohm project, of course, purposely plays off of uh, the genome project. If you think about the equivalent of the, you know, we talk about genotypes and phenotypes, so what is the phenome uh, as opposed to the genome? Well, one aspect of the phenome is uh, the behavioral manifestations uh, of a phenotype, uh, and the speech ohm you can think of as uh, a, a data set which captures, again, one facet of the behavioral phenotypes, and then all of the implications of uh, capturing that, analyzing it, um, understanding uh, developmental uh, trajectory, developmental disorders, all of that can come out of um, uh, data analysis that I'll talk about. So our initial goal and really what was the, the primary thrust of this project um, going back uh, really a decade um, in, in the making was to advance our understanding how, of how children acquire language uh, in natural context. Um, so more than, in particular, characteristics of speech, understanding language and, and construction of meaning. And really, the, the approach that, um, that's key here in this project is <coughs> to collect data that has three characteristics. One is it's longitudinal, which means we're collecting <coughs> over the course of uh, many months. It's ultra-dense sampling rate, uh, so up to uh, 10, 12 hours a day of data. Uh, and it's in vivo, so rather than uh, observing kids in observation labs, bringing them into a, uh, some kind of infant observatory, uh, instead we want to go into the home, which is where uh, you've got the natural social interaction. Um, and then we want to couple that because when you put longitudinal ultra-dense together, what you get is a, a, a huge amount of data uh, to develop new tools to actually um, deal with that data. 
Um, some of the differentiators, comprehensive observation. So um, if you are in the field of uh, child development or child language acquisition, uh, what's typical is you take, uh, you send a, your graduate student <coughs> into some, someone's home or you bring a, a kid and mom into the lab and you get a couple of hours of audio. Uh, if you're going to do a longitudinal study, you might collect one or two hours of audio recordings um, once or twice a month for a few months. That's sort of the typical data set. Um, <coughs> which leads to uh, a, um, a very uh, weak foundation for any kind of theory because highly, uh, very sparse, uh, incomplete uh, data. And a lot happens. Anyone who has children or has observed children grow, um, things, things happen in the course of days. Uh, so if you're sampling every month, it's really not, um, not good enough for a lot of purposes. And <clears throat> to minimize observer effects of having someone with a tape recorder or a camera uh, in a room um, and then developing tools uh, are all uh, differences. And so this is kind of a, a one slide summary of the entire project. Although the initial thrust uh, it, uh, remains to understand child development, <coughs> um, one of the things we're now looking at is applying this technology to uh, detect and characterize and treat uh, certain kinds of developmental disorders. That's a, a, um, a direction we're heading. And I'll, I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. <coughs> And then there's various things like video scrapbooking, parenting aids. You know, as parents, we are recording our, our own home life. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, uh, um, possible applications in those directions. Um, retail behavior analysis. Uh, so if you are, if you own a retail storefront um, of any sort and you've got cameras in there, um, you can do what you want with that data. Or that's what that's what I and some of my sponsors think. And I'm curious what all of you think about that. Um, and that's another thing that um, I hope we'll talk about at the end. So there's a, a lot of possible directions of impact of the core technology um, independent of or sort of beyond the, the language acquisition. <coughs> so just for a, a bit of um, a one slide context of where the support came from, uh, now almost 10 years ago I, I did a, some work as part of my own PhD thesis where we had mums and infants come into a, a lab setting, play with toys. We recorded what mums said to infants, so there's audio data. Took the toys, let this little robot, little camera on a stick, look at the same objects, uh, and then um, built a little system that would listen to whatever the child was hearing, see what the child saw, and from that acquire a lexicon that linked speech to visual experiences. And that was really the, the start of what of many projects, including the Speech Jump project. And the idea was to <coughs> build a machine that, in, in some limited capacity, hears and sees what the child hears and sees, uh, step into the shoes of the infant, and, uh, and learn something about the language. Okay? And there's a lot more details about what made that interesting. But essentially, this learning machine acts as a lens into the learning environment of the child and lets us test hypotheses about ways that a child may be learning to segment speech, to create semantic categories, to link what you see with what you hear. So ball goes with things that are round, uh, orange goes with certain colors, and so forth. Uh, so this system did, in fact, learn from child data. And that got us thinking, well, this is interesting, but if you bring a child and a mom into uh, into a lab setting, they don't they don't act naturally. It's unclear what percentage of uh, waking hours of a child are spent playing with toys versus all the other things one does. Um, so uh, we that that gave rise to um, looking for a new data set. So we fast forward ten years. <coughs> um, this is a picture of my house uh, in Arlington, and if you were to come into my home, uh, that's the living room. And if you were to look up at the, uh, the ceiling here, there's a little, see a little camera poking out in the, the ceiling. Um, so this is a, uh, a very high fidelity, high resolution camera. And there's a little privacy shutter that can open and close. And, uh, and a microphone. I have my pointer here. So. <coughs> Uh, okay, well, thanks. <laughs> so, microphone, camera, privacy shutter, there they are up there in the living room. If you were to look through the camera, look down, this is going back about two years now, so there's my son and my wife uh, in the living room. Um, that's 
going opening up into the dining room. And <clears throat> above every light switch, there's this little device, which is a, uh, that's the interface to the house. So there's four buttons on this touch panel, um, microphone, camera, uh, this we call the oops button, um, and that's the diary note button. So if you press, for example, the camera button, that's how you turn video recordings on and off. Uh, similarly, if you press the microphone icon, the house stops listening. Um, if you press the oops button, that's like the anti-TiVo button. Uh, a little dialogue manager comes up and you can say how many minutes back in time you would like to erase uh, immediately and permanently from the, uh, the, the recordings. <laughs> so originally we only had two buttons and, uh, and had several oops moments and realized that we would have to add that. And then this was the fourth and last button that got added a few months into the project, um, which is a diary note. Um, so when you, if you press that in a back-end database, there's a little uh, flag that sets saying something interesting happened uh, that someone in the house decided to uh, annotate. <coughs> and then you, we actually have a simple practice, which is we just say diary note and describe what happened in diary note. Uh, since the house is always recording, that gets uh, connected to the, to the flag. Um, so this is a view of nine of 11 cameras throughout the house. So the kitchen, dining room, living room. There's the baby room with the crib, the downstairs lower level entranceway. Um, <clears throat> and this is a little day in the, the life time lapse video of uh, life at home. Uh, you can see sometimes these shutters uh, coming in and out, blocking the video. And we transition from, from day to night and finally lights out. <clears throat> um, I'll play you now a little example of, uh, of actual video so you can get a, a sense of the quality of one channel. This is my son at about 15 months uh, and I in a little interaction. What's that over there? Over there, that ball. Oh. And I'm going to come back to that little clip uh, in a while. So um, what we have done over the past, it's actually now closer to 30 months, so these numbers need updating, is captured um, about 80,000 hours of video, 120,000 hours of audio on a uh, 200,000 gigabyte disk array, uh, a piece of which is pictured right there. Um, and so, you know, in some sense, you are looking at um, the world's first speech home. Uh, it's roughly 70 or 80 percent of uh, my son's um, waking hours at home from birth till the age of about two and a half. Okay, so um, now this is a raw, unanalyzed set of data. Um, so it raises all sorts of questions of uh, what we can actually mine from it, and I'll try to give you a sense of some of those tools. Um, so the first question is, how do you um, as a human analyst, or uh, um, sort of anyone in the project, even get a sense of what's in the data. Um, so we've got 200,000 hours of multi-track raw recordings. Um, and actually, I was going to make a comment right at the, the opening, talking about the, the primaries and so forth. Um, uh, I worked on a project 10 years ago to put the House and Senate online. So we had all of the audio recordings um, from the House and Senate, which we <coughs> aligned with transcripts and put online. And it just reminds me, if you think about the, the total amount of video and audio of any anyone who's of political interest, um, it's probably not 200,000 hours, but if you shave this down to, to number of single track uh, audio and, and video, it might be uh, comparable. And a lot of the issues of how you mine that and, and find the bit you want when you want it um, and, and in various other ways do higher level analysis um, of essentially a person's identity or their, their history or their, their personality or their development, um, regardless of context, there's, I think, a lot of um, points of connection. So I should have said that earlier. But um, Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar, this is a spectrogram. This is a standard way of visualizing uh, the content of audio all these little bursts with, with these lines. Uh, to anyone who has spent a little time looking at spectrograms, you immediately recognize is the fingerprint of speech. Okay. What's interesting about this is uh, that's, that was a couple of minutes of speech you just saw go by. And without listening to it, you know something about it. It, it doesn't take long to learn 
Uh, for example, where is there speech versus no speech? Uh, is someone screaming or singing or just talking? Uh, is there water running because there's broadband high frequency? All those can be just read off of a spectrogram, and that's why they're widely used um, by people who do sound analysis. So we started thinking about, how about an equivalent for video? Can you see something about the content of video without watching it? So this is my wife and I in the kitchen preparing a meal. And one of uh, a handful of techniques we've been playing with in our lab to start visualizing content of video recordings. So what we're doing here is analyzing where there's movement and leaving a trace. And as time scrolls by, so just as it did on the audio, so you can see here I am holding a couple of plates and moving around and leaving uh, this trace. And there's my wife. And, and of course, the two of us are um, in, a, in a sort of dance, interacting um, as we go through this, uh, as we go through time. So each of these space-time worms are uh, a capture of, of one person's uh, movement. And again, what's interesting now is this is over a minute of video, and you can just at a glance uh, read off certain things, like there are two people, and they seem to have certain kinds of coordinated uh, activity. Um, if you want to know exactly what they're doing, you'd have to go in and, and watch. But um, uh, it gives you a certain level of, of insight. So if you put those two things together, here's some audio. There's two people in, in one room versus another in a third room. In fact, you can read off of this that the, there was a person who was uh, in the living room and they moved into the kitchen where they joined another person. Um, and uh, there's speech and there's, there's some water running in the faucet. So that's a couple of minutes across several channels. Um, where a, a fair amount of information you can read off. And here is now a day throughout the house, so about 24 channels, um, a period where all the um, sensors are off. <coughs> so this is actually a piece of software called Total Recall. Um, we have fun with our, our uh, naming. So you load up uh, um, a day of data on Total Recall, and you can very quickly zoom in. And So here are these little space-time worms, so you can see how many people which room they were in, when they were talking, and so forth. Um, and here's three months, okay, where at this resolution you can just see where there is and isn't data captured. Um, bathroom, master bedroom are generally off. A couple of days we weren't home, so recordings were off. Um, so you can zoom in and out and, and then dive right in and, and view specific video. Um, Here's that clip again. What's that over there? Over there, that ball. Oh. So, given the tools for visualizing, what we're now doing is developing tools to start uh, sort of a first cut at analyzing fine-grained details of the data. So that little interaction between my son and I, if you were to sort of uh, replay um, kind of key moments and imagine where I'm looking as a, a sort of spotlight coming out of my head. So I'm only attending to certain things and not others. And likewise for my son, um, <coughs> as those spotlights <coughs> or sort of direction of attention are shifting, um, in tight synchrony, their speech. So what's over there, I say, as I look out towards the, the green ball, but my son is looking at me. And then we have this moment of joint attention where he follows my gaze. So he's now looking there, and he says green ball. Right? That's, a, that's a magic moment for language acquisition, joint attention. We're both attending to <coughs> physical uh, common ground, um, linking up these symbolic bits of uh, um, speech to what we're both seeing. And then he actually closes the loop, and I give uh, some reinforcement. Okay? So there's all of this um, very intricate timing and interaction, which, uh, by the way, if a child has autism, uh, they may not exhibit at all. So that timing and those, those uh, patterns of joint attention fall apart at a very early age. And if you can detect them, that's also interesting. If you can characterize how they're shifting over time, uh, that's uh, of great interest, clinical interest. So just to seed where this could be useful. <coughs> so how do we analyze that kind of gaze and speech pattern uh, out of this raw data? I, I'm not going to bore you with details, um, but just give you sort of the bottom line. We've developed something that we uh, um, playfully call blitzcribing, because it's just so much faster than transcribing. If any of you have transcribed speech, you, you 
would be surprised or hopefully impressed by this number, we can take an hour of what we call house time, which is 14 channels of audio across an hour of data, and in about an hour or 40 minutes transcribe it totally. Right? Which means for about 120K, we're going to transcribe um, everything my son heard and everything he said from the age of nine months uh, till the age of 24 months. Okay. And the result, the estimate, will be uh, about 16 million words of transcription, transcribed data. And just to put that into context, uh, there's something called a childless corpus, which is um, an international collection of child language development data sets that have been accrued over the last 50 years. And there's, so there's several hundred different research teams' data sets. And when you add all those together, uh, they constitute a 15 million word corpus. So it just just happens to be that this one data set is larger. Um, and the point here again is, if you want to look at fine-grained development of speech, you need that data. You need to, to see what's happening uh, uh, moment by moment. Um, this just shows you many of the different kinds of social context, joint attention, uh, one person looking at the other, but not vice versa, face-to-face. <laughs> Uh, reading together, uh, approaching each other, <laughs> uh, grandpa hiding in the tent. Um, and what we've uh, developed is a method using computer vision that takes a computer generated head and actually locks it onto the video head and constantly re estimates uh, positioning and orientation so that the outcome is a relatively precise estimate in three dimensions of where a person is looking. Right. Um, <clears throat> again, to fast forward a bit, imagine if you are, um, <clears throat> uh, you own Sears or you own a bank and you've got a security camera and you're curious whether your customers are paying attention to certain products or certain ads or whatever, or if there are certain unusual behavior uh, that could be predictive of theft or some kind of uh, 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 behavior that you don't want to see happening in your in your retail space. You can imagine why this kind of um, technology could be of interest. Um, so now let me uh, take a, maybe five more minutes and play you a couple of uh, bits of data, just so you get a sense. We'll kind of take a, a little tour through the speech realm, um, if you will. So since we're now transcribing, we can do things like say, let's pull up every time my son produced, said the word ball. And let's look at the social and the physical context within which he said it to get a sense of what he thinks the word means. And is he using it in an overly general or overly narrow way, or has he really nailed um, what, what the term refers to? And so to do that, you need to, pull, you need to find all the data where he, he produces the term. So here is a little walk through about nine months um, of him saying ball in different contexts. <laughs> He's, he's now speaking in full sentences, by the way. He's, he's turned out to be an early talker. Um, if you are a, a speech-language pathologist and you're interested in development of speech, uh, one kind of time lapse that would be really interesting is to hear the development of a speech pattern of a, of a target word. So um, what I'm about to play you is an audio-only um, time lapse, which um, uh, I believe um, just pr provides a new lens into um, speech development. What you're going to hear is my son, when he originally started saying water, his approximation to it was gaga. Um, not unusual. Very early words uh, tend to be very simple, sort of uh, syllabic approximations. Um, and over, again, the course of nearly a year, he um, develops the proper pronunciation. Uh, sort of the adult form of water. And what you'll hear is it's not a totally linear path. So he'll be stuck on Gaga for a while, and then there'll be this really interesting transition period where he's two steps forward, one step back, uh, and eventually he gets it. So 
Uh, let me play that. <laughs> and uh, I, I usually can't resist, and I and I won't, and I won't today. Uh, I'll play you one more um, bit of evolution of speech, which is my personal favorite. Um, and this one, again, we're fast forwarding through about six months, and we have the um, the video to go along with it. And here you start to see the very personal nature of this project too. So, I, I have no idea how many times he said daddy now, but I'm, I'm sure it's a, a good chunk of the 16 million words. Um, and final little video clip I'll show you, and this is just the, you know, the power of um, recording all the time and being able to go back and find things, um, you know, all of the sort of the things you might expect, sort of typical dramatic things for first time parents, things like uh, first steps um, are often captured. So here are the... Uh, the first steps that he took, uh, embedded in the in the archive. Can you do it? If you listen carefully, you'll hear him whisper the word "wow." That was him realizing no, he's, he's, he's done something. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. Um, so, to, to kind of summarize, what we're doing now is indeed transcribing all speech heard and produced by him, uh, annotating selected, so what we want to do is trace the, the birth of specific words or, or specific phrases uh, and go back and, and pull up all the, the full context in which the words were not just produced, but long before that, he's of course hearing them in different contexts and uh, in, in various ways, starting with uh, joint attention, but then also looking at the objects in the environment, uh, annotate the video, uh, and then analyze um, the roles or the predictive role of social and physical factors in how, um, how we can explain which words he learned first. And that's sort of the, uh, again, that, that very specific thrust that's, that uh, is driving things. So um, just to uh, conclude, one uh, question on the, the direct extension of the speech um, is, well, all of this from a scientific perspective is limited. Um, because we have n equals one, we've got one subject, right? So um, it raises a natural question. How much you do this for larger numbers of people? How about 10, how about 100, how about 1,000 or more? Um, and of course, you're probably wondering, why would you want to do this, right? Um, so over the last six months, we've been working with um, the director of the Center for Research, for the, the uh, uh, the director of research at the Groden Center for Autism um, and looking at because of the specific kinds of cues that are immediately are most relevant for understanding early language acquisition are also some of the telltale cues for um, early for a detection of autism so now at as young as 24 months there are reliable cues for detecting autism um, the question is, can you detect it earlier? And once you detect it, can you characterize all of the many different developmental trajectories that children are on? And as you introduce treatments, can you characterize, quantify uh, with large sets of data and the appropriate tools, the effects of treatments? It turns out all of these are open questions. And so there's great interest in that community to explore these sort of tools. Um, the problem is, I didn't, one little detail about the project I didn't mention, there's about 3,000 feet 
of concealed wiring embedded in my house and pulling this contraption out you know as cameras and mics all embedded there's nothing exposed very expensive very difficult um, no one else is ever going to do it I would guess so we've started thinking about um, a portable device and my, there's our microphone and our camera and sort of this arch lamp with all the computation and storage and networking built into the base um, there it is looking from above so gives you the same sort of fisheye view of what's happening in a single room. Um, so in some sense, scaling back, not going for nearly 24-7 throughout the home recordings, but looking at key, area, key areas where a lot of interaction happens and capturing uh, data um, in, in those contexts, and streaming it out of the home right, into uh, analysis lab, where working with clinicians, we can um, sort of dig into the data uh, in, in various ways. So. A lot more to be said about that. In fact, it's beyond a concept. There is a prototype of the lamp that you could come and see now in the Media Lab. Uh, the head and, and neck are constructed, and we are planning later this year to deploy a pilot batch of these in, in homes in the Providence area. Um, and all sorts of questions, and that's my last slide. Um, all sorts of questions get ra raised on not just my own home data, uh, and I'm happy to get into how we're dealing with various obvious privacy issues that have um, but this turns up the um, uh, sensitivities, right? Now we have other people's data coming into our lab. Um, and often these are families, uh, unfortunately, where the parents are headed for divorce. Uh, statistically speaking, if your child is diagnosed with autism, you're far more likely to see a divorce in that family, which means the, the, you know, the likelihood of everyone being happy about that data being captured and, and all of the other kinds of information that might be captured. So these are things we're starting to um, realize. <laughs> I won't say we're as far along as, as uh, knowing what to do about it. Um, and yet, at the time, there's huge motivation um, to get the data if it could help clinicians get a better uh, fix on what's going on. So there's a whole set of issues there. And then in the retail space, um, we are indeed talking to, so l let me just give you a, um, a, um, so, sort of one possibility. The whole idea or premise of the analysis of this data is this idea of cross-modal uh, or semantic grounding, cross-modal analysis. You've got the context within which language is, is being used, that's captured in the video, and then you've got the actual linguistic signal, in this case, speech. And we want to build machines that can understand the connections between the two, right? So someone is saying certain things in certain contexts. If the machine can see what's going on and hear what's going on, you can link them, and all sorts of uh, insights can come out of that. So let's say you um, own a bank. And now you've got these cameras that can similarly see the behavior of people. And you don't have speech. That turns out to be illegal, as I'm sure many people here know, to <laughs> record in a bank. But you do have electronic transaction records. So as you're interacting with this uh, um, bank teller, everything that the bank teller is doing is being captured. So that is a semantic, uh, that's a carrier of semantic data, right, of sort of task-oriented activity. And you've got video. Um, it's not quite plug-and-play, but similar ideas. Um, can be applied. And it's not just our project. I think there's an uh, you know, emerging set of technologies that um, will make it easier and easier to um, connect uh, human intent and, and uh, communicative um, uh, signals to context at, at various scales. This is a relatively fine grain, you know, two, two person sort of interactions. Um, and a lot of our uh, corporate sponsors see that, understand that, um, and so. That that's sort of another uh, direction that this work um, may well head, and I think with that I'll I'll stop talking. So thank you. <laughs> Bottom line, n not a big deal, and <clears throat> in fact, uh, pretty much I'm just asking how heavyweight is the software that you've designed to be implemented through the analysis of the data that you captured? How how heavyweight is it? Um, some of it is very heavyweight. Um, as in very um, inefficient and very expensive for, for computation, but there's two things happening. You know, one is, of course, the cost of computation is dropping, right, and the density is increasing, so the same, uh, you know, um, volume in our machine room can do more work. Um, and our algorithms are getting better, and so, so they're both converging towards it, that 
being uh, not an issue. And just to give you, a, again, a sense of where technological trajectory, so Seagate is one of our sponsors, and we're working closely with them. In fact, the whole disk array is filled with Seagate drives. Um, and they are interested in understanding the algorithms we're developing and taking a subset and making them part of the firmware that's in the disk drive. So there is, when you think about computation as sort of that computer that you have to buy that then processes it, the data, that one layer of the processing, Seagate, whether it's our algorithms or someone else's, that's, that's going to be in the drive. So if the, the drive will know its video and it will extract certain kinds of features um, so that the work's actually done literally as you're streaming the data onto your drive. So a lot of that becomes transparent and, and lightweight. I'm curious about, when um, you thought about comparative um, smaller projects, so comparative meaning um, your family. Um, uh, a culturally different family, I mean, a, a, uh, um, a family that um, perhaps is, I mean, like in a different part of the world, right? Mm -hmm. a, 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 an orphan, in, I mean, a, a child who is an orphan in a different kind of, from a develop, child development point of view, a different kind of, of language acquisition setting, and even in a single parent household. I mean, those would be four models mm -hmm. where the language acquisition uh, could be radically different. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just watching the snapshot, you're an engaged, loving, caring <laughs> parent. Um, and let's assume your wife is too, but that's not a model that's universal. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could layer on, well, um, the mom didn't have much food before she, you know, she delivered and that, that, mm -hmm. that, I mean, all of those kinds of things that affect the organism that you start with, the baby, when they're start, you know, affects this kind of, so I'm thinking about how, you know, from a, because I think you could take interesting lessons from one to the other about uh, how to encourage language development, modeling, I mean, that, that whole bundle of, yeah. Questions. Right. I I think the um, as opposed to deep. I mean, sixteen million mm -hmm. words and a zillion hours. Yeah. As contrasted to saying, well, let's take sort of smaller windows mm -hmm. of time in different <coughs> settings because the conclusions might be ultimately more useful right. from a quote therapeutic point of view or a theoretical point of view. Yep. Um, I have a request. Could we turn the projectors off? I think the room's heating up and it's a little loud on this side. Um, so, the um, I think first of all, definitely that's necessary in the long run. I, I think the way I'd characterize this project is, in many ways, in terms of methodology and technology, trying to push the envelope uh, and show sort of a, a proof point. With, with one data set, and then to engage the much larger community of people who are interested in an incredible number of different factors which are all believed to play a role, um, and put this technology and this methodology into a lot of people's hands. And I don't think we're going to single-handedly do that. It, you know, sure, we could do another family with one of those variables, but in fact, if you just watch so I have a daughter now who's eight months old, and if you watch her trajectory, it's just you know totally different. And uh, and anyone who's got you know two kids knows that happens. And over time, maybe it's they're they're driving each other's differences, but early on, unlikely. So now, is it all genetic, or is there some uh, biases uh, behaviorally? Well, of course, there was only one kid to attend to, and now there's two. So there's there's all sorts of differences. Teasing all that apart is a, a gargantuan task, right? And it's going to require engagement of um, the community. So I think uh, there's a lot of skepticism about the technology from the child development community when we started this project. And a lot of skepticism uh, about the um, being able to handle privacy and, and those sort of issues. Um, and so I think one sign of success, one, one metric of success for the project, from my point of view, would be to overcome that skepticism for at least a subset and, and get more people um, to be doing some of the things you're suggesting. 
for the clinical, for the autism. Isn't, isn't just a, uh, I mean, isn't... If you did bite si more bite-sized things, yeah. that might, because you can, you know, you can anonymize the data, or you can sure. anonymize yeah. the person, so I mean, that's from a privacy point of view. Yep. And if you, if you took off, we're, we're trying to sell the data to McDonald's to, yep. to say when they first start saying Big Mac, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, if you take out those and you're yeah. just interested in the language acquisition yeah. component and you do small bits. Right. So, so th what you have done is characterize more or less the state of the art in child language uh, acquisition research. And it, it's a, a totally viable strategy for understanding certain aspects and totally unviable <laughs> for understanding other aspects. And so the point of this project is to push ahead in that, uh, that other direction and say, look, there's, with new tools and methodology, we can also look at, I, I think there's great value in doing longitudinal, even though it'll come at a cost, you, you can't diversify and do snapshots of lots of families. Um, but there's a, a lot we just don't understand that only can come out of doing these detailed you know, there's, there's a history of diary studies in the mm -hmm. field, right? And they're, um, uh, in general, seen as, as of great value, but um, all sorts of theoretical biases, right? The diarist only notes what seems at the time mm -hmm. somehow interesting, and that is, of course, totally driven by their theoretical dispositions, and we're not, um, we're not susceptible to any of that. Um, I think over there, and then Judith, and then... So maybe one, two, and then three. So uh, let me first say that this totally rocks. This is amazing. Um, uh, let me then sort of steer away from some of the child development stuff and maybe into some of the privacy stuff that sure. I suspect has some of the Burfin folks a bit worried. Um, I look at this, and my first conclusion is that this would be fascinating to DHS. And the reason there is the path tracking, the head tracking within large sets of video and audio. <coughs> And I sort of wonder whether you've thought through any of the implications of people looking through video in a very different context in public places that are already widely monitored mm -hmm. and essentially trying to do predictive monitoring there to figure out if you have a person in a space who intends ill to a large group of people, whether you're able to predict that behavior pattern based on someone moving into that space. Mm -hmm. So the stereotypical example is someone walks into a public space and starts immediately looking for security cameras, which is mm -hmm. actually pretty mm -hmm. atypical behavior. If you're doing this sort of real-time um, video tracking, and particularly sort of focus tracking, that seems <coughs> like a real possibility to come out of it. Let, let me just sort of add one final observation, which is that increasingly so in the U.S., certainly in the U.K. for a long period of time, it's become quite common to have extremely pervasive surveillance, but that's mostly had a panopticon effect, because there's a general sense that no one is sort of doing real-time monitoring of this video. There's simply too much of it. It's simply there so that you know that you are being watched. You could theoretically come back and be recorded. You seem to be suggesting in some ways that the, the stuff that you've got works as, as quickly as sort of Sebastian was, was pushing on, that you might actually be able to have a, a categorically different form of surveillance, a form of surveillance that is basically figuring out who might be a person of interest within a scene, either to, say, a retailer, but certainly to a, a security professional. And I'm sort of wondering what you've thought through mm -hmm. as far as those, those implications of, of how the, the nature of surveillance changes when you're able to do this level of analysis on top of it. So I guess, first of all, just a point of clarification, which um, I, I think in the interest of time I moved through so quickly, um, and now I realize when you'd mentioned real time, um, what we're doing is um, not real-time analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's not sure. just a matter of the computers not being fast enough. Um, in fact, the whole method of data annotation, both speech transcription, if you, if, you, um, ha if you had a chance to read the title, it said Blitzcribe and colon semi-automatic speech transcription. Um, so it's not automatic, yep. right? So it's not real-time because there's a human in the loop. Same goes for the video. Uh, in fact, um, uh, state-of-the-art um, so video analytics technology would not allow you to track um, head orientation the way I showed in that clip, um, unaided by a human. So the piece that I didn't show there, uh, <coughs> just, just for uh, um, interest of time, uh, is a second layer of software, which is a human operator that does the analysis. So, so that's kind of one for clarification. That, so that means the analysis happens offline. Um, 
is DHS uh, interested in this sort of thing? Yeah, of course, they have a, a, a huge program. Uh, you know, they, they, um, it's the Acquaint, Acquaint program, I think. Um, VASE, sorry, video analysis and content extraction. Um, and there's uh, uh, many research teams around the country um, focused on exactly the kind of uh, questions you're asking. So, yeah, there's a, a technological, uh, obvious technological overlap. Um, but um, that's not, that happens to not be where any of our funding comes from and, and what's driving the questions. Um, did I answer your question? Or so you started off by saying, "Am I concerned about?" And then, but you didn't end with a clear question of what the concern would be. Sure, uh, you're taking money from um, retailers. Um, this is likely at some point to become an extremely useful tool for marketing behavior. Mm -hmm. There's one set of questions and concerns there. If I'm walking into Sears, have I implicitly <laughs> given permission, not just for my purchase behavior to become demographic data? but also for my entire store behavior to become data to build a profile. If and when this tool becomes useful for commercial applications, it's going to get deployed in other contexts. One of the contexts is going to be a security context. How does that change the answer to how you feel about that? Mm -hmm. um, how do I personally feel about a, the security context? The scenario uh, you just laid out, I feel really good. Because you just you laid out that someone's about to do something bad, and can we predict that? Uh, so our technology doesn't speak to that. We're not even doing real-time analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose that could be a, a first step. In a, uh, and then the second question you would say is, well, what if they weren't about to do something bad, and your technology, you know, screwed up and uh, and had a false alarm? And so I think that's where things get more interesting, right? It's when you have so all these technologies have, uh, you know, type 1 and type 2 errors, and then you look at the, the larger context of what are people doing with the tools um, when you're never going to have, um, I mean, you know, one basic limitation here is um, you can watch behavior all you want. You're not looking at cognition, right? You, uh, you can watch my son eat, but you can't tell if he's hungry or if he's just doing it so that he can go play after. Uh, you can't see hunger. You can just see the, the movements of eating. So similarly, um, any time you're trying to do in, intention inference, it is inference, and so there's going to be errors. Um, so I don't think it's possible to give you a, a simple answer to how I feel about it, because you, you have to lay out uh, what the kind of errors are and what the policies are tied to how you uh, use that technology given those sort of the error table. Well, then just following that, then how, I mean, how efficient is your technology and, um, you know, the video or the audio where your son is saying water, I mean, has this already been, um, you know, clarified so that all of these actually are water or some of those, what he's saying, actually not him saying water and we just sort of think he is? And has somebody already filtered that out or have we skipped over that? Or, um, and, so that's not so much a question of efficiency as accuracy, I think is what you're asking, right? Um, so for accuracy, this is a... Um, a well-known problem with early, early language annotation, which is a very idiosyncratic speech patterns. So we had this, I mean, another odd detail of the project I left out is one of our, our first um, speech transcriber was part-time nanny and part-time speech transcriber. And her, <laughs> her workstation was in our house. So she spent 20 hours a week doing one, 20 hours a week doing the other. Um, Generating yeah. data and transcribing. That's data. right. That's right. Yeah. So, because that's how, for example, uh, I was able to show you the progression of Gaga. If you went back and listened to those early recordings, you wouldn't know what Gaga meant, unless you spent a lot of time watching the video, right? right? And then you could sort of, because we do have the context, but that'd be extremely expensive in, in, in land car. Um, but a kind of bottom line on efficiency is for the mature speech forms. Um, so by around. Um, so the early, what we really focused on in those early months when my son's speech was very, um, you know, difficult to understand was to just transcribe his speech since we have a lot of that um, transcribed. And so we're focusing more on the adult speech, sort of the input. A lot of the focus is more on what did he hear in what context and how is that predictive of the order in which he produced things later. And that adult speech is, of course, easier in terms of that question. Um, but the cost is, is a real issue. So typically it would cost you a few, a couple of million dollars to transcribe this data. And we realized, well, we can't afford that. 
and there's a technological solution to bridge that and push it down. So 100K is a whole different story. So I think you're waiting. Um, I'd just like to hear you speculate some more on um, your view of a roadmap and the bottlenecks. Like, it seems like right now um, the human element is already the bottleneck in terms of it's your um, blitz transcribing. It's uh, 120,000 for 16 million words. Uh -huh. I assume that's because of man hours of transcribing. That's right. So um, are there any technologies you see um, as being able to circumvent the human bottleneck? Uh, just go nuts. <laughs> like, I want to hear your, um, what are some estimates of when different bottlenecks could potentially be overcome? Or are these like things that are here to stay because there's some capital H hard problems mm -hmm. that would prevent uh, massive adoption? So massive, can... ado massive adoption of what? Well, um, like for instance, the cost of implementing this, if you can just, just it's all algorithmic, and you can get out the human middleman, those costs are all going to go down very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's a human element that's irreducibly in there for a, mm -hmm. a long haul, that's going to be, um, that's going to determine the price and the degree of mm -hmm. use of systems like this. Like, right. Right. could it be real time? Well, that depends on. So you have the human element there that keeps it from being. Yeah. Well, again, I guess to clarify this, this the question of real time, it really depends on what purposes you have in mind, right? If you're trying to do any kind of, say, developmental analysis, or you're interested in um, certain, uh, you know, people in politics, and you want to go back and pull out things they said, etc., those are all non-real time. Those are offline, after the fact kinds of analyses. You're mining and you're pulling out patterns or analysis, right? So it's not a real-time issue. Real-time is typically when you want an interactive system that will actually intervene on the fly, right? Um, which is interesting, and when all of our robotics work are, are real-time systems where that's the case, right? Um, but everything I talked about today is sort of this offline, non-real-time kind of thing. Um, in terms of human bottlenecks, um, in that particular case, that's, uh, you know, in, in Technology terms, that's called automatic speech recognition. Um, a lot of people think automatic speech recognition is solved. They're wrong. <laughs> if, you, if you take the, uh, the recordings of, say, adult-to-adult -adult communication from uh, my house, and I were to play them back to you and, and to 10 other people in this room, there would be a very high intertranscriber agreement in what was said. So it's a very doable task by humans, um, you know, high 90% agreement rate of what was said. If you plug that same data into the world's best speech recognition system, which is actually paid for and tuned by the intelligence community, and we ran such a test, uh, you will get single-digit accuracy, under 10%, right? So there's a huge gap in technology, which is why we developed these semi-automatic techniques. Um, that's not to say progress is not being made, but I think we're actually, in that particular technology, um, we, we have hit against a, a wall, and there's new research required to get us unstuck. That's just, but it's maybe drilling deeper than you intended. So the humans are using um, other, they're using context. They're using the mm -hmm. meaning of what's being the, they're using contextual information of what we already deep knowledge about language to do the task. Yep. While the expert's systems or whatever you're doing, it can't do that. <clears throat> so that does put an upper bound. Your blitz transcribing can only go so fast and so cheaply, it seems. Let's scribe, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, not only are people using deep context, but I suspect the very sh kind of what you might call a shallow or front end acoustic processing, I think there's also different things going on in, in how we're listening to the speech. Um, so, I, you know, when you have a stenographer, right, or a real time closed captioner for real time television events, um, they, t they transcribe a lot faster than if you make a recording of that event and ship that tape recording to someone to transcribe. And the problem is, in that case, a technological bottleneck. And that's a bottleneck we've really focused on. So people are pretty fast. Uh, machines could be faster if they had all these things you're talking about. But that's a whole other research program, not one that, that we'd set out to, to try to bite into. Yes, I, I'm not sure who was, but... Um, so, what have you learned about human speech acquisition that you didn't know? From this project? Yeah. Uh, or from the, the one that led to it? Yeah, from this project. 
Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a hypo so, hypothesis about something you might learn from this project? Sure, uh, multiple. And the reason I say nothing is you might think of the project as having uh, at least three phases. Phase one, data capture. Phase two, uh, uh, tool construction. And phase three, analysis. Um, so we've completed, more or less completed phase one. Um, which took a, a huge amount of engineering and plumbing of sort of uh, bit plumbing. Um, and we are very much in the midst of phase two, which is creating tools, which is what I've shown you. Um, and we uh, are turning the corner on, on having enough speech data transcribed to start doing some forms of analysis just within the, the speech. That's why the answer is nothing for uh, actual results. It's a, it's a long-term project to, to kind of deal with that. Um, so it, when you look through the literature on um, theories of early language acquisition, um, there's a wealth of theories. Um, it, it's just incredible how many theories there are um, and how little data. And for any given theory, there tends to be a small piece of data that support that theory, unsurprisingly. Um, and many times they make contradicting um, predictions. So a very specific um, set of hypotheses that we want to do a bake-off on if you will, is to look at um, um, some specific cues that a child may be using to bias what they attend to and what word to meaning mappings um, they, um, they are hypothesizing. So for example, if when I hear a certain uh, speech label, I am looking at something and you're looking at it as well, um, versus not, how important is that? Um, when I hear some novel word usage, um, I'm engaged in a particular activity with you versus not. So there's some activity context. There's some joint uh, attention context. Um, there are multiple competing um, objects uh, or, or uh, events in the scene versus there are not. Um, how important are each of those in giving me a leg up on learning? Well, in isolation, each of them seem to be important. Um, but we have no idea how they interact and how important each of them are in any sort of a natural context where they're all at play. And then there's various other simple things like um, I actually think spatial um, co-location is really important. How, how close am I to, to my son? Uh, or are we in uh, opposite parts of the room? Or are we moving around? Is there a third person in the room? Is it morning? Has he just had a meal? Do any of these matter? Um, so we can systematically um, look at any combination of factors and what we're looking at again is to see which subsets, if any, are predictive of which particular words he learns to produce in a semantically appropriate way first. Right? So predictive value of later productions. Go ahead. One thing I just want to do is to shift this a little to some questions for the group as a whole. Yeah, sure. And, um, because I think there's, especially as you're talking about, you know, starting to set this up in other homes, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's just a tremendous number of very intriguing questions about privacy, about data ownership, et cetera, that a project like this raises. So, you know, like right now, we all expect a new house to come with indoor plumbing and lighting and things like that. So imagine you, know, you go buy like a new condominium and it comes beautifully wired like this. So they say it's, you know, it's the ultimate, you know, therapeutic tool that you could have for your growing family is to be able to you know, record everything about this. So what are the steps that we would need before this would be, from a sort of data safe practice, a useful thing? What are the things that people would need to know? What are the laws that might need to be changed about um, you know, your liability in, in cases of data? What would you need in terms of giving releases to people who walk into your front door? You know, what does it mean when someone has come in your front door and it was fine with them and then you know, they had 10 drinks and now they don't want this data recorded anymore? <laughs> who has the rights over that data? Or, you know, or the couple who came here for dinner, it was perfectly fine, they're divorcing a year later and they want your data. So, mm -hmm. um, or you even know, kid consent. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, at what point does your child become a, you know, a teenage rebel and sue you for all your, your data? <laughs> so, you know, I just, I mean, I think that there's, there's ways in which this can become, you know, you know, this is, while this is a unprecedented project in this notion of it being in a home, there are 
you know, in various places, other projects with people recording everything about their lives. And I think it's not far-fetched to think that this might be something that, in not that far in the distance, might be a feature in a high-end home. And so to understand, you know, what are these steps? I mean, and actually, just to and reinforce that a bit, we we are, in fact, working with one of the largest toy manufacturers in the world, who are exploring. Uh, um, this concept as a piece of consumer electronics and early focus groups show really positive responses maybe because some of these implications are just you know they're not being presented and not even being thought about I, uh, I have a, a bit of uh, experience with this particular issue I've written a bit about it in the uh, hospital clinical context for medical records and the, the insight there is that uh, and it's not commonly looked at this way, is that it has to do with networking of information that the doctor-patient relationship includes, uh, which is supposedly private. And the thing we discovered is that the, the merchant, Sears, or the hospital, uh, does not understand the difference naturally between the fact that when the patient comes into that hospital, they have an expectation that their information will be correlated across visits which could be done biometrically, but yet the publication of that information so it can be aggregated across different hospitals or mm -hmm. across different is something that needs to be voluntary from a privacy perspective. So it, just trying to get that thought across about the difference between interacting with one merchant who's providing surveillance and then how that is mapped across merchants and teach the patient to understand that what's been de being done to them by credit bureaus is not necessarily what they wanted. That there might not be a societal interest. There may be a societal interest in the case of credit bureaus doing this aggregation involuntarily, but there isn't one in the case of medical information. At least th there's no well understood societal interest around that. And that's as far as we've gotten. But then we need to go back to the original question about it that Ian asked is, um, you know, if, uh, the co if the companies have a right to collect your purchasing data, where does it stop and the, uh, from collecting any other type of data? Where do you draw the line or where do you even consider start drawing lines? I mean, they certainly don't have any limits on, co you know, con yeah. co But even, data. maybe even just keeping it in the domestic environment because that's, I mean, that seems to be a place where the, it's very fuzzy. You know, what are your rights in terms of collecting data on people who walk in your house? You can imagine the, the Google system where, you know, you end up, you know, signing the NDA before you make it past the lobby. I, I'm sort of imagining, you know, the system where in the entry hallway there's the, the, the biometric, I agree, that I'm going to be recorded in the context of the house and that I may be used uh, in aggregate research data or perhaps I'll be anonymized or something along those lines. Well, have there been cases of people doing surreptitious recording or just ongoing rec audio recording in their houses? Well, there was the entire, what, X10 camera, you know, based around the notion that you should, you know, place little wireless cameras around your house and uh, surveillance for security purposes, which, mm -hmm. of course, had also nefarious purposes. Most people know because it, it was the, the best of the pop-up ads. But um, I'm sure that the folks in the room who actually know something about law probably um, have some history of... Uh, of covert surveillance within your own home and whether that's actionable in one fashion or another. What do you do with your own when, guests? Is there a difference when people, what's your expectation of just in a non-technically sophisticated environment where you're not recording everything uh, uh, without someone's knowledge, you're not recording, but is there an expectation of privacy that if you come into my home and we have a conversation and it may be something you just as soon I not tell you that somehow you have an expectation that I'm not doing it. I mean, do you do you have to sign something when you come in, or do I have to sign something that whatever you tell me, uh, just in a social setting, is private? I mean, it's this it's a similar kind of right. But I'm not. I mean, that's the question here: is is it the same when it's actual it, recording? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, I think there's. A, I mean, yes, there's certainly all kinds of both social mores around privacy, but I think there may be different ones that come into play when you're actually recording and archiving data. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's similar, but it's it's so far advanced when you have comprehensive verbatim recordings and the ability to go back and extract 
selective components that it's it's almost I would say quantitatively different from the the social you know he says she says kind of uh, and, um, and then <laughs> and then there also is a design component in that because when you are um, speaking with someone and you you know something about them you negotiate something about that relationship so I think one of the things that I'm sure you're working on are the questions of how what is covert and non-covert it's like someone walks up to you with a camera you know what they're doing with something like this if there's a you know is it different if there's an ongoing real-time display showing what's being recorded and what's not so that people have a very visceral sense of what's happening versus you're saying a, that informed consent is impossible for recording mm -hmm. let me just be take the most extreme position for the lawyers in the room is, is I, I'm not saying it's impossible. What I'm saying is that, you know, I think particularly as technologists, a lot of our approach seems to be on the design side. So what is what is it to be informed? Because one of the problems with a lot of informed consent is you get a little note saying there's recording oh, yeah, happening here. It's impossible. Which is, <laughs> which is different than something where if you're recording, there's a constant, say, display of what's being recorded where you have a continual instinctive reminder of what's happening. So what does it mean to be informed? If you can well, delete it, that's one. But well, we're recording well, right now. Are we, uh, we, do we need a reminder constantly that we are being recorded? We do. We give it at the start of every talk. No, but as, see, as I, I've, I've been did, wondering for a while, are we still recording? It's yes. Kind of in the, yeah. But we don't know. Yeah. So it kind of speaks to the... Yeah, exactly. Just to answer, um, you know, in, in case you're curious, how do we deal with this in our house? Uh, in fact, when we went through IRB uh, approval, which was an interesting process at MIT, um, <coughs> because they came back and said, we don't know whether to say yes or no. Because nothing looks wrong, but this just looks so odd. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up getting, uh, actually, the, the director of the... Um, that uh, project at CMU that I mentioned, the the, um, the big database of child data, um, to come in as an outside advisor and look over the protocol. Uh, but one of the things that IRB asked us to do, which is uh, kind of uh, comical, was to have a little um, little placard as you come into our house. So when you first enter, you'd see a sign that said, you know, everything is being uh, audio and videotaped, uh, and maybe posted on the internet, just to make sure that there's no question of uh, what would where this data could go. Um, and if you uh, you know if you don't want it on, just let us know. What we ended up doing, um, just FYI, we had that up for a, a few months, and then realized that that didn't really work, so we took it down and made a, 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 proto a convention within our house, which is whenever anyone comes to the door, since there is a controller right at the door, we just we turn recordings off. And only um, um, friends and family who know us well and who understand the project uh, and typically would say, you, you can turn it on, but whenever you come into our house, uh, by default, uh, we, we have the recordings off. So that's where it evolved to. Uh, kind of on that point, one thing I'm curious about, does your son have any inkling of the cameras or the microphones? Or, and if not, how do you intend on him learning about it? Yeah. Um, he's, I mean, he, he loves watching some of the clips that I showed you. Um, he went through a phase where he loved grabbing the eye packs, the, the little controllers off the wall, and just turning the cameras on and off. And then he just got bored of them. So that's, that's the... Uh, so is he aware? Um, no, I wouldn't say overall he's aware or, um, no, I think he's still a little too young. And we're, we're um, in the, uh, um, we're not recording very much anymore, so we're kind of, I always was asked and always thought about when would be the day we stop recording? Well, it turns out there's not a day, it's just sort of the density of recordings have dropped off. And now, honestly, it's more of a, um, yeah. And, and as much interest for my wife as myself. My wife is a faculty member at Northeastern and interested in the speech and hearing sciences. Um, so there's kind of overlapping interests. Um, but we both feel sort of like, well, now our daughter is, you know, <laughs> babbling beautifully. And we have to get a little bit of that, you know, if nothing else. If not for the high density scientific uh, reasons, you know, um, just to get that video. <laughs> that home video uh, collection to be complete. Problem is, of course, 
my son's always got that two-year lead. So, yeah, my new stuff. Is, is, is there fear that your second child is going to discover that there's, you know, 200 terabytes <laughs> of data on the first child and, you know, a, a, a mere, you know, 12, 12 meg of her development and sort of, you know, be scarred for life in yeah, terms of the... the thought has occurred, yeah. <laughs> Make it up on the beach. Second child always... Yeah, they always get chipped, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There, there's a sense in which the name of your, your project, of course, draws on the Human Genome Project. And, yeah. and one of the questions that often comes up with the Human Genome Project is, whose genome are we sequencing? Mm -hmm. um, there's an odd sense in which if you've just created, and it sounds like you have, the largest and most comprehensive set of data on early language acquisition, are, is there any worry that any idiosyncrasies in your son's learning patterns, any idiosyncrasies in your son's speech, suddenly, essentially, you know, affect the development of this field for some period going forward. So, I mean, it, 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 I assume this is now why you're why you're trying to sort of replicate yeah, this, I, I think so that, that we're not all Craig <coughs> Ventner. Craig so, Ventner, yeah, did himself. No, no, no. I know, and, and, and as well as the woman and man from uh, Chicago who were in the original. Uh, so, I think that that ambiguity about whose genome partly comes from just the way the term was used in the popular media early on. Uh, comes partly from estimates of how much difference there is between, you know, your your genome and mine, if, if that's defined in an individualistic way. Um, when it comes to pheno phenotypes, and in particular behavioral phenotypes, there's, there's little question of the, the huge amount of differentiation of the behavioral phenotype as a function of environmental input, all right, which is not sure. an issue with the genotype. So I don't think the same kind of ambiguities are, are going to come up. And so, I mean, you know, this question earlier about going to different families and so forth is, of course, motivated by that so kind of obvious understanding that the each speech genome is going to be very different from the next. But I, I think still, <coughs> if you look at the influence of um, certain diary studies, and I'm not claiming that our work will ever attain that level of influence, but there aren't many detailed diary studies that have ever been done. You know, Piaget did one, and Tomasello did one, there's Roger Brown did a couple. So there's a handful of diary studies which were very influential, mainly in um, raising new questions, right? And then to answer them in a sort of scientifically acceptable way, you have to have larger sets of subjects and, and control for all sorts of things. So it's kind of a hypothesis generating uh, uh, type of um, project. So yeah, there will be certain biases. Um, I, I, again, sorry, I'm not paying attention to ordering, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering that because of the way research funding operates, mm -hmm. you seem to be looking at this mainly as a business application, as a monitoring application and drawing inferences from that. So what ways do you foresee this being used as a consumer application? For example, uh, suppose I have a kid next year, and maybe I want to follow this development So as a consumer application, do you think it is feasible or because of the way funding has been given, you're so solely I think, focused on the business side? I think you might have filled in some details about how the funding drove this that are not quite accurate. Um, uh, Media Lab is an extraordinary place where although we have a huge number of industrial um, sources of funding, it's a primary, I mean, that is what paid not only for this project, but the stuff that I talked about, you know, almost a decade ago now. Um, none of it has had any, um, there's, there's been no commercial application to date from any of it, right? And if I tried to sell it directly as that, they would have said, okay, and here's some commercial data, please develop your algorithms on that data. That's the typical kind of directed research, right? So in fact, um, I, I would say, um, actually with total confidence that the Human Speech Zone project would not have happened um, if there was, uh, if I had to make a case for commercial viability in any clear sense, um, tied it to any commercial interest, or for that matter, you know, DHS or any of the others. So, um, it, <coughs> part of this project is a... No, I'm, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just saying that this clearly has positive implications oh, no, and on both sides. By the way, I'm all for commercially driven research, I'm, so I'm it wasn't a value it. judgment. I'm but I'm just I'm, I'm in B school, so I'm yeah. not against that at all. Yeah, no, I'm just <laughs> clarifying. <laughs> um, so my point is that do you foresee this being applied in a consumer setting? Absolutely. First. First. First, first because the privacy concerns will be bypassed. I don't know if they will. 
So if you walk into a, a retail store and, and your expectation is that that's a surveillance camera to keep, I don't know, you secure and the products safe from theft, which is why those cameras are there today. So for people who do reflect it all on why those cameras are there, they're security cameras. And now that data is being repurposed uh, for consumer uh, buying habits or, you know, uh, certain stores, grocery chains want to figure out what to do with 24 feet of yogurt. Right? Take, a, take a more extreme uh, well, example, take Vegas. Uh -huh. Which uses that data incredibly differently than any retailer would. Yeah. <laughs> but what are the expectations? Everyone knows that about Vegas, right? Right, but everyone knows about Vegas, but that's just the expectation that we have of retailers that it's only a security cam, but Vegas, they know that people are doing profiling, they know that people are watching pits, mm -hmm. they know that people are keeping profiles on certain people, that yep. facial recognition. You're saying that what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it does. Eventually, it won't stay in Vegas. But that so, was adjusted over time, and over time, maybe we'll get used to the security cameras. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I, I, this is a question, uh, there's many experts here. So wh what do you think will happen to the retailers if they start repurposing the, this information, which I'm guessing because, I, I mean, there's probably no law that says anything clearly one way or the other. It's theirs, and um, I think they'll do it. But there'll be almost no reaction. I think no one yeah. will notice. Yeah. Why I, is it I, I think it's. Than clicks? It, hmm? Why is it different than it clicks? I think I'll start. You're right. right. online and you're clicking on a site and you click on on a particular item. So and let me you give don't... you a. Here, here's here's a difference. Okay. So remember those space time worms that mm -hmm. I showed you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. An implication of that is I, we're tracking a person. As long as there's one worm, you could say, show me all the video of that worm. And now imagine every time you go to Walmart, okay, uh, although you are anonymous, you're just a video blob floating around the, in the store, you give away your, your anonymity when you make that purchase with your credit card. right? So now I'm Walmart, and I've got um, a billion hours of data. And I'm going to pull every time your credit card was used and all of the space time worms that are connected to those credit card touch points. And now think about the implications of that, right? Now I can make a video collage of what you looked like, who you were with, et cetera, et cetera, um, in, in Walmarts over the last, you know, number of years. Mm -hmm. um, that might bug you. That might be upsetting to you, right? They can do it today. They, they can't do it today because they're not actually, A, they don't have the, the resolution for it to be especially upsetting. B, they don't store the data. The same effect. No, I'm just saying the, te the technological infrastructure. If you look at the cameras, you look at the storage arrays, et cetera, none of it's there. But in principle, you're right. They could do it today. But Vegas is doing it today. Who is? Uh, Las Vegas. Um, Yes, and I think it's a special context with certain expectations. Um, I guess another question here is the crossover thing that Ethan mentioned, because so nobody will notice, nobody will care, but uh, we found that the government happily goes to AT&T, AT&T hands over their records, uh, uh -huh. then the Congress retroactively excuses them from all liability. Mm -hmm. So, but even if, even if a slightly less sinister sense than us, I mean, I, and this was sort of where I was trying to go before. Uh -huh. We've all gotten used to a certain amount of surveillance. Mm -hmm. Public doesn't mean what it used to mean, yeah. right? Public used to mean I might be seen by another person. Now there's a very good chance that you're seen by a video camera. If you were a person of interest, being seen by those video cameras suddenly becomes very important. We've all sort of gotten used to that, but it's got this sort of background panopticon effect where we know that the vast majority of the time we're being watched. It suggests to me that this sort of system where you're going further and at the moment is in post-processing, but I think you would argue five, ten years from now, mm -hmm. you might be able to do in terms of active processing, finding people's field of view, mm -hmm. uh, calculating path, isolating it through a crowd. Suddenly this is a, a, a really different level of surveillance that comes into play. It probably comes in very gradually. It probably introduces itself in retail spaces. Very, very few people refuse to use their grocery store coupon cards, which, you know, all it is is essentially a way to track you and essentially feed you a little bit of coupon to, to let you do it. It will probably come into play. The question that I have is, what's your reaction to public space going to be? Is that going to change over time? Are you going to handle being in public differently, knowing 10 years from now 
that by moving in a public space, you're generating a stream of data that's very, very useful to commercial entities and very, very useful to a DHS type entity. I don't think, I think that's a, that there's no demarcation in the case being Facebook. Is Facebook a public space or a private space? And all the stuff we're seeing now with, uh, you know, as Facebook tries to document its practices as a merchant uh, with respect to, uh, uh, is, is being played out. And so I, I don't, again, my point is informed consent very, is impossible. To Facebook, which actually but began a moment in this room. A moment ago, you <laughs> said that people wouldn't notice and wouldn't care. You're the same person who five minutes ago said that they wouldn't notice and wouldn't care, and now you're saying there's an act of rebellion. Which one of those is it? There was certainly an act of rebellion against Facebook. I think the question is, to what extent does it end up being intrusive? Facebook didn't think there was going to be an act of rebellion. I think it's a very sensitive edge as far as how intrusive it ends up being and what the implications are coming out of it. Oh, I'd just like to go a step further. Um, there, there's only a couple of people doing this now because the ergonomics are all wrong, but some people are recording every moment of their life. They walk around with a little camera. There's only a couple of people doing it, and that's kind of nuts because it's kind of bulky. But there, the equipment will shrink, and it's not just going to be centralized merchants or things like that. Anyone could be recording you at any time. People are going to be T-going their entire lives. And so... What are the limitations on like a person? Like before you go into someone else's house, are you do you have to turn off your camera? It's not just um, going to be centralized. Everyone's going to be doing this, or so I've heard. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you want to have like you know? Well, that's what brought to me by the it, 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 It's useful as <laughs> like an aid to memory. Yeah. Like if you have your day recorded, and you want to recall the conversation you had with your boss, then you can rewind and be like, oh, he said exactly X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And also, like that special moment too, you can go back and replay that with the full fidelity of a digital recording. So it's just a matter of the ergonomics getting just right. And then there's a legal issue with that, and I, a lot of people there might have no idea how that would work because that's. Is that the age of question of where do my rights begin that? in your freedom? Yeah, mm -hmm. from, that's reminiscent. I mean, I, I think a lot of these it seems like. Because we, we've had, uh, Judith was just saying, also brought to you by the Media Lab. So uh, many of those projects originated at the Media Lab. Um, and it seems that um, it all depends. The real question is not whether you capture the data, but what you do with it. Um, right? And so, uh, you know, the, and, and my expectation when I, this data is being captured is an expectation tied to intent of, of the person capturing it. And, um, so I would I would suspect if you did something that was somehow uh, uh, um, caused some great embarrassment or some great loss, um, now you've crossed the line from you know securing goods in your retail space to doing something damaging to that person. They're going to come after you. Um, so it's it's all about intent and purpose, and, and expectations are tied to that. Um, I mean that's my. Naive, non-legal <laughs> take on. But there also been plenty of examples of it. You know, in France, when they were given speeding tickets, nobody cared when they videotaped you until they videotaped somebody was, uh, you know, out of marriage. There, right? Sure. Yeah. So there were um, the same places where people did their street views things. I mean, because they right. suddenly had pictures with identifiable people walking into an adult bookstore. Yep or license plates that could be read parked, you know, in the, where the prostitutes are or whatever, and stuff that had nothing to do with Google's intent, okay. but certainly <coughs> at least upset some people. And um, had the right to feel that they were not private but anonymous in that situation. And what happened with that? I mean, nothing, right? That's, that, I don't know. The images are still... That's the problem. There's nothing, I mean, there's I no there relationship was... between those people and Google, like the, as there is between Facebook and its users. Sorry? There, because those people don't have any relationship with Google the way Facebook does with its users. I mean, Facebook uh -huh. users uh -huh. mean something to Facebook, whereas right. <coughs> random guys on the street mean nothing to Google. Right. So... Maybe we'll just all walk around in full burqa. Right. <laughs> burqa <laughs> become the, the, burka. the fashion of the future. No, yeah. So this is just like um, yeah. tort law, I guess. Like if someone you get damaged by someone, and then you could sue them in that case. But if it was just, um, it seemed like you need a labyrinthine system of I don't know what. Um, if you couldn't be like, let's say you're you're a video blogger, and then someone just showed up in your thing without consent. You have to get consent of every single person you publish, or is it 
or do you do it on a case by case? Wouldn't that cause a huge? Wouldn't that just choke the legal system? If anyone could, I, I don't, would it? Well, again, I guess it depends on the space because when a newspaper publishes a photo of a street scene with identifiable detail, they don't have to get permission, right? Because it's in the public. But if they were in someone's home, they would. So I don't think video blogging seems similar, right? Must must be in the same category. Um, audio recordings seem to be treated totally differently, right? At least in the state of Massachusetts, I think very few places where you can legally be recording audio. Even though you can have cameras all over the place, you can't have microphones, um, which I now understand makes total sense from where the real privacy issues are in our home. It's, uh, it's not in the video. No, it's all about audio. So. I just brought an interesting quote that uh, yesterday was on my calendar by chance. And yesterday I thought it was interesting, and today I think it's even more interesting. But it is a quote in the New York Times from October 14, 1980, written by Charles Ferris, who was the chairman of the Federal Communications, the uh, chairman of the SEC, which <laughs> says, and I quote, when my children's homes are wired, a computer will have a record of what they buy and how much they spend. It will know whether they pay bills quickly, slowly, or not at all, and it will know where all their money comes from. It will know whether they watched the debates, or a football game, or a controversial movie. In other words, it will know more about them than anyone should. We can and should move at the outset of this information era to address the potential privacy problem so that it, in fact, does not become an actual one. What year was it? 1980. He's actually, uh, Ferris is, is still around. He, he was uh, chief of staff for Senator Mansfield. Um, Mansfield was, was majority leader of the Senate in the 70s. And um, he's a lawyer uh, named partner at a major Boston law firm. And it would be interesting to get him to come in here mm -hmm. uh, and use that quote because he's a, uh, and he's a, he's a very plugged in democratic political person. Um, it would be interesting to hear to hear yeah. his perspective given that quote 25, almost 30 years 30 later. Years. One of the interesting things about that quote is um, how it still. how it places um, because I there's this ambiguity or or not in that case of agency. So it like the home is somehow the agent that is in control. It's the data. What's that? It's the data notes. Well, that's a very odd place, way to talk about data, right, as the it, right? So it's not like data is self-aware. It's meaningless. It's, again, a question of Yet. who's doing what with it. Well, that's another talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> we talk all about machine meaning, which is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, almost, uh, but um, this came up with our our project as well. Early on, it was you know the, it was the Truman Show because it wasn't clear who was going to see the data, or Big Brother. A lot of the questions of who owns the data, who's going to see the data. Um, but I don't know what it means to say it's the house. <laughs> but the context of that was more likely. I mean, his his context was more likely um, J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah, actually, when Hoover was the head of the FBI, surveilling people mm. privately and then. Doing something with it, the data. Yeah. Um, Teaching is also still an issue. More so, sure. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very sure. much. My pleasure. I have a couple of Errol questions, um, Errol Hamdel and uh, questions that I.